Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to chat and thank you, Mary Lee, for the introduction. I've been involved in roses since I was 10, actually. Uh, a neighbor needed uh, some pruning done and my dad said, oh, well, we'll help. And he said, we, and I think I became the we and I worked my way through college, partly gardening. So uh, in, at the University of California in uh, chemical engineering. But I've always had a love for uh, gardening and roses have been a particular love for many decades. I've given a lot of talks on uh, the uh, subject of pruning and winter care. I also give talks on other areas. I've got my name tag on here because I'm a master gardener and that's a little more recent, but I've been uh, giving talks on roses for over 30 years. I'd like to uh, give you the information on what you need to do this time of year. Clearly, they don't look like the thing in back of me. This is my virtual background. It's my front yard. It's a Sally Holmes rose, one of my favorites, and the most photographed rose at Filoli. If you uh, sit under the arch, that's a, two Sally Holmes coming over the top. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very prolific rose, as you can see. This was actually done from cuttings about two and a half years before this picture was taken. And right now it goes out about 10 feet in each direction from one cutting. I also have a couple of hundred cuttings uh, that I've done in the last few years. Right now I have about 120 of them in my yard uh, in little tiny pots. So I've, uh, I teach propagation too as well. So let me uh, go on with the uh, presentation and I'm going to share my screen. This might take just a second. Sorry, that might come up again. Dormant rose pruning, pruning and care is what I'm going to be talking about today. And you can see a little tiny picture of me when I did this at our Veterans Memorial Senior Center in uh, Redwood City, which I did for many years, again, probably decades. Uh, and uh, you can see there uh, what we used to be able to do. So now we're trying this a slightly different way. What the learning objectives are today is how to prune dormant roses. And dormant's in quotes there because in our neck, neck of the woods, it really doesn't get completely dormant. Southern California, they may bloom all winter, uh, but uh, you really want to get them dormant. I'm gonna talk about tools and garden safety, how to prune the different types of cuts and uh, different rose, four different rose types, how to, train as well. Planting, organic amendments, dormant spray, and I put in parentheses organic and optional. More and more people don't want to spray at all. And if you do spray, you want to use the less toxic, less harmful sprays. And I'll talk about that. And then, especially this year, as we're worried about water, I know I use a lot in my yard when I have it, and uh, we want to talk about water management for roses as well. Right now is the time to get ready. I've actually started because I have so many uh, and I've started to uh, do something I call a haircut. I'll talk about that more. For any rose this time of year and through the time when they're starting to uh, bud out, you want to prune out the dead diseased or damaged and crossing or weak canes and suckers. That goes for everything. Modern roses, old roses. If it's dead or damaged, you want to get it out of there. But you do want to prune once blooming roses after they bloom. And I'll talk more about that, but uh, you really will cut off many of the blooms that have been forming if you uh, trim these once blooming roses now. And you may see some of these in the landscape. Uh, they are out uh, often covering a, a big fence or maybe even climbing up a tree. Do those after. You wanna shape the plant and prune the large plants leaving pencil sized or uh, uh, pinky finger sized main canes uh, or branches if you wanna call them that. If the plant is getting too big, you prune it aggressively. If it's too small, prune lightly. If it's in the middle of the walkway, you probably have to prune it more heavily. Winter is also a great time to move, plant, repot, or replace roses. I'll talk more about that. First thing I want to talk about is safety. 
if I were in front of you, I'd be putting on uh, some of these pieces of equipment and uh, showing them to you right now. And I've got a video that shows this, but be safe. Roses have thorns. Technically they're called prickles. Uh, you wanna make sure that you protect your hands, your head, your arms and your eyes. Personally, I've had a big climber whip up and hit me in the forehead. After that, I always wore a hat with a bill and I now wear clear goggles uh, to, or uh, protective uh, glasses if you have just uh, glasses. You wanna sharpen your tools and I'll talk about that. You wanna clean scratches and thorn or prickle punctures and you wanna use something that's liquid to get down into the uh, uh, the uh, puncture, something like iodine or something very liquid. And you want to come in, wash up afterwards. Treat any scratches or cuts immediately. Don't wait till after your pruning. You want to use something that's bypass pruners. It's easier on your hands. If your arth hands are arthritic like mine are, uh, and you, you don't want to use the anvil type. I will talk about that in the videos. I'm going to show a uh, brief video now and I hope this uh, comes through clearly. There may be a couple of interruptions. I'll wait a second after I uh, start here to uh, talk again. Hope you can hear this well. Hi, I'm Stu Dalton. I'm with the Peninsula Rose Society. I'm a consulting rosarian with the American Rose Society. And I'm a UC master gardener with the San Mateo, San Francisco district. I'm going to give you a rose pruning uh, discussion aimed at the, uh, the dormant season pruning, normally in our area, the peninsula in San Francisco, that would be around the first part of January through the middle of February. I'm doing this a little early because I wanted to get this on film, but, uh, and it's a nice day today, not rainy or whatever. Uh, what I'm going to show first is safety issues. Uh, right now, you can see I've got a long sleeve shirt, a little uh, less likely to get stuck by a thorn, heavy pants, a hat. And what I'm gonna show you now is a couple of different types of gloves. The common theme they all have is, these are long gauntlet gloves to protect the upper arm. Uh, I'm gonna put on some uh, gauntlets that if you don't have these gauntlet gloves, you can use these with regular gloves. These also protect the upper arm. So I can reach into a rose and not be hurt. So I'll put those on, put on a pair of gloves. These are gauntlet gloves. These particular ones and these have goat skin in the uh, palm, and that's to because it's thorn penetrating uh, resistant. So the other thing you want to do, just like in the kitchen with, uh, you want to have a nice sharp knife so it uh, causes less injury. You want to have nice sharp shears. These are bypass shears. I'm going to hold these toward the camera and show you these one bypasses the other. And they're like scissors. These are called an anvil shear. You can sort of see the uh, flat bottom and a, a sharp top. These are good for things that you want to crush, some kinds of stems you actually crush for a cut flower. These make a nice clean cut and they're sharp. You want to make sure they're sharp. And these are happen to be a Felco number no. seven, which has an ergonomic handle, but all of these are uh, good shears. You take the blade, hold the sharp blade, and then pull a carbide sharpener about four or five times along it. And that makes it very sharp. It'll cut paper. For slightly larger uh, things that need to be cut, this is a number 20 Felco. It's also a bypass shears. This is a very strong mechanical advantage shear that also extends out to get very high mechanical advantage and we'll cut through very, very thick uh, inch and a half canes or branches, if you will. This is a very useful tool to get up big things. To get way up on the top of, of some very large climbers, you can use these type of remote shears. 
And then finally, what I'm going to show first in this uh, is to, uh, oh, uh, somewhere, I don't have my goggles right now, but I, I would normally be wearing my goggles as well. Uh, what I'm going to show first, and I'll take a quick break before I do it, is one of the things I use because I have 250 roses. I need to cut them in a hurry because uh, I need to fill up a couple of different weeks worth of green bins with the material. Uh, and I don't want to compost the rose uh, material because it may have a disease that overwinters. But this is a great thing to help us uh, uh, do a lot of pruning in a hurry. I'll show that in just a minute. Sorry. There we go. There we go. I uh, hope this is uh, coming through all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the uh, next thing I'm gonna show is something I've actually done now on my own yard. And uh, you can, uh, I can look out and see this right now. I'm giving it a haircut. And uh, as someone who's bald, I really understand haircuts. Uh, but uh, the, the idea in the rows is to take off some of the volume. You're not doing the final prune on many of the roses though you can do it on shrub roses. Uh, you take off some with something like a hedge trimmer and it's quick. Okay, uh, this is a uh, Sally Holmes rose that I'm gonna prune with the hedge trimmer. I have to take off the bulk off the top so that I can put it in the green bin. Uh, and so I might take it down a third. I may take it further than that uh, later, but I can do that with the other kinds of shears later on. The nice thing about this is quick. Now that's a lot quicker than I could do with the hand shears. Uh, I'm going to go over here on the other side now and I'm going to take off a little more on this side. Like I say, it's quick. And uh, this shows actually uh, the result after pruning some very large material off of one of these Sally homes. Uh, you want to make it easy on yourself. Whoop, sorry. That's, uh... Sorry, uh, make it easy on yourself and on the rows. Uh, and you have a, uh, you wanna cut cleanly, use the mechanical advantage to your advantage uh, to make it work. You wanna take out the oldest growth periodically and that rejuvenates a rose. The Sally Holmes I was just working on are about 30 years old. And some of the canes, like the one in this picture, and that I just took out are almost that old. They're a couple of inches in diameter. The biggest cuts you can take with a saw and then the loppers, those very big mechanical advantage can cut most of it, smaller loppers and up to the shears. How do you rejuvenate a rose? Well, you, I'll show that in the next slide, but you take out the uh, oldest growth periodically. If you have say uh, eight or nine big canes, uh, some are newer than others. You might take out some of the oldest ones each year and eventually you've got a new rose. And how old is the oldest rose? Believe it or not, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 years old. It was actually bombed out during the uh, war and uh, regrew from the roots in uh, Hildesheim, Germany. This shows the base that I cut out with the, uh, the saw here, and I cut out this large one. That's what was lying down on the ground and showing you. But you can also see that there are some uh, big new shoots here. And I'll uh, talk about this in the video. This is where I cut it out. These are all new growths and I can uh, train these and they'll grow up big in the next year. This is one year old now over here. 
and this will take over the dominant, dominant growth. But you can see here, for instance, I cut that off last year, all these are new growth. There you go. And how do you do the cut? The cut is going to be uh, something that's very important. Uh, you eventually want to prune, and I hope you can see this, uh, my hand is uh, open in the middle, sort of like a vase. You want to prune to point the growth outward. Point the growth outward. You do that by finding buds uh, or a leaf set if you haven't taken off the leaves uh, that point away from the center of the plant. This is important because to reduce uh, any kind of fungal disease, for instance, and it actually helps get air and light in the middle. You want to do it with the sharp bypass shears, not the anvil, like we talked about. It's great to prune at an angle. And you'll see if uh, you look at this area that was not pruned properly, was pruned too high, things die back. Well, how does it finish up? Well, if you think about the growth energy, it's going up that way. And the uh, angle here is a natural healing angle. And it, it doesn't have to be 45 degrees and it hardly ever is, but you wanna make it slanted so that the bottom part is close to right straight across from the bud eye. I always say this is a nose and a smile. That's the bud eye, and this is where the leaf set was attached underneath. If you cut it too high, canes die back. If uh, I clicked it. Uh, would be a good example of something that's... Sorry. If you cut it too low, you uh, see it dries out. The water... Uh, it evaporates and uh, you get this bud drying out and it dies. The proper cut is uh, this uh, type of cut and I'll illustrate it with uh, the, this very short video. Uh, would be a good example of something that's not pruned for the final uh, cut. You can see above every uh, leaf here and under every leaf here 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 there are buds uh dormant buds when i pull off the leaf there's another bud right underneath right here what i'm going to be doing is cutting above that about a quarter inch with the sharp shears like that the bottom should be close to uh the the bud the bud will be pointing in the direction that new growth will happen in the spring. And so what I'm trying to do is shape the rows and make it grow outward so that it's not closed in in the middle with crossing canes and uh, lack of air circulation and light. What that does is it keeps you from getting good uh, fungus control and insect control. The air and light helps on uh, disease control. Uh, would be a good example. So next I'm going to talk about uh, pruning large and mini roses. Uh, large roses are often budded onto the base. Uh, if you can see my hand, think of this as the bud union down here is the main stem going down the roots down below. On the top, you've got that open hand I talked about. What do you want to do is again, remove dead disease crossing and very weak growth, clear out the center, leave an open vase uh, and uh, remove the oldest canes periodically. With floribundas, uh, flor, flower, abunda, a lot of, uh, you uh, have more branching structure and lighter pruning typically. Light pruning be, being roughly maybe a third reduction. Heavy pruning, which I often do, a half to two thirds reduction. And I'll show that in the video in a minute. Uh, you wanna get rid of the crossing canes here. Those are in red. Uh, and uh, you can keep ones that are uh, from the bud union. That's my illustration of a bud union. Uh, but if they're weak, you can take the weak canes out and leave a couple of strong canes, three to five typically. This next series is the longest series in the whole thing for video. It's uh, how to uh, deal with shrubs and reducing 
the height is the first step. This is a, uh, a potted rose, but it's the same for most roses. Hi, this is a bush or shrub, and I'm gonna cut out a lot of it because this is really tall. It also had uh, a lot of uh, alfalfa pellets and that sometimes really causes very long growth. This is getting close to eight feet tall from the, from the pot. Been in this pot for quite a few years. It'll have to be repotted probably every fifth year or so. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is cut off a lot of the height. I don't need it to be this tall. I don't want it to be this tall. So just give it a haircut so you can see what you're doing. It's not the pruning so much as it is getting rid of the extraneous growth so you can see what you're doing. And if there's anything that's really just in the inside and spindly uh, growth or things like that, I can get rid of that as well. There are too many uh, breaks from the bud union actually. I'm going to cut out at least one of them right off the inside. And right off the bat, you can see what this does is sort of open up the middle. Okay. The next one uh, carries on from that point, and I, then there's a third uh, short video as well. So I'm going to take a little bit off of this side so, again, I can see what I'm doing and uh, see what needs to be taken down further. Eventually you want to strip off as much of this as you can so you can see what's going on inside. I'm stripping off, stripping off a few leaves, pulling down on the leaves. And I see this one, this, uh, it's a, down here it's a good size, it's a reasonable size, but I've got several of these in here and I'm going to say I want to keep a few of them. So I will Cut off some of the side growth and make a decision here which ones of these I want to uh, keep, which I want to get rid of. This one's probably the least robust. It's new, but it's not very robust. Down at the bottom here, I have some very small growth. And I hope you can see this in here. There are quite a few of these main stems. You really need about a handful of them, four or five or six. It's about at the maximum you need. And I've got several more than that. So I'm going to take out this all the way down at the base. And I'm going to uh, do some more pruning and I'll be back in just a minute. Uh, obviously, I've stripped off the leaves here, and uh, eventually you want to have uh, stripped off all the leaves, disposed of them properly, not left them on the ground, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, this uh, shows you some of the litter that is uh, comes with pruning. Leaves, dead leaves, etc. There is mulch on here, and I'm not going to take that out, but I'm going to take out all the leaves that are uh, have fallen because if you uh, find a leaf that has a uh, set of orange spots underneath that's a type of a fungal disease called rust looks rusty that's why they call it that and if that leaf is down on the ground even when it rains or anything else the, the spores are right on the ground and they'll uh, reproduce and come back the next year so you want to clean up all the leaf litter and here i've got uh, a stem with dieback. It's dead from here all the way down to here. So I'm going to take the whole thing out. I don't need this many main canes. This is brand new. This is brand new. Uh, both of those are nice strong canes. This one's strong, this one's strong, this one's strong. So I've got plenty of the canes or branches if you will. I'm going to take off some of the obvious things because I don't need them. And I don't need this one right here. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
name. Uh, now, uh, this one's sort of crossing. This one is not the strongest one. So I have to figure out which one I want to keep. I think I'll keep the one that is not the strongest. I'd rather get rid of it. And then uh, prune this back and separate the canes. So let's see. There is a bud. <clears throat> Here is something I can use as a prop. We'll talk about Come that. Across, put it on a thorn, and that'll keep it. Uh, out away from the other then i will uh, cut these back a reasonable length this one's going that way this one's going that way this one's going that way this one's going this way you say boy he's putting it down a lot it was eight feet tall well it's going to be about two to three feet tall when i'm done there you go. That's a shrub rose being pruned. I didn't say it up fully, but that's the idea. And I said I'd talk about props. Not everyone uses these. Not everyone knows about them. And it's exaggerated here, so you get the idea. I want to open up the middle, like I said. I want to shape it. Props are used in a lot of things. I use them on my apple trees, etc. But uh, in roses, you can find the thorn as a place to stick the uh, the prop, and you can make the prop material out of uh, uh, waste material with has, that has no leaves. You cut the bottom flat so it sticks on the thorn. You make a Y, or you use a Y, and you uh, can leave it on there. I found them there the next year when I pruned. They don't tend to go away if you attach them to a good thorn and put a good angle on it. You can use a couple of them even on one to move it out of the center and make it open. Okay, how do you do a uh, standard or tree rose? Most people don't know that a tree rose is actually four different pieces of growing material. There's the rootstock down below, there's the main trunk, and then again, what most people don't know is there are two different bud unions on the top. You can actually find tree roses that are budded with two different varieties. I've seen them even at places like Home Depot. Uh, you prune what I call the antlers because they sort of look like antlers uh, uh, separately. You've got the two bud unions and you've got this uh, structure up the top. You do it much like you would a, a bush, open an area, cut out the weak crossing dead or broken canes. Anything else from the roots or the trunk here is a sucker. You want the stuff that comes out of the top and out of the bud unions. This is a very short uh, piece showing after I've taken all the leaves off and cut it back, how you clean up the, the end and the bud, there are two bud unions, one slightly lower than the other. This is the top one, that's the bottom one. This is a old Olympiad. Okay, uh, now I'm going to clean up the uh, uh, bud union here a little bit. You can see there's old bark. There are a few stubs from prior, prior pruning that I should have taken off last year, but I didn't. I'm cleaning it up. You can actually use a wire brush on these, and you might get some additional what are called basal breaks, meaning from the bud union or the base here, you get new growth out of this area. Uh, allowing it to get more sunlight on it helps. Uh, having things like growth promoters like alfalfa, which has a natural uh, growth stimulant called tricontinol, and that is something that can actually help on basal breaks. But you can see it's now maybe a little off, uh, lopsided, but about 12 inches, maybe a little up to 18 inches uh, off to the side. Some of the old growth uh, removed, and it's more or less symmetrical. Uh, that's what you want when you're done with a, a 
uh, rose that is going to be a standard tree rose. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about climbing and how you prune and train climbing. Yes, you remove the dead and disease, damage or crossing, but you also uh, do it differently, especially as they're young. You want to train for the first year or two. You train to the structure, whatever the structure is. Uh, you can just let it uh, uh, lie on the ground. You can see in back of me on this virtual picture here. Uh, that's it can be used as a climber. It also can be done as a shrub, but that one doesn't have any structure. But if you train it, you can train it along a horizontal uh, wire or uh, trellis on a fence. You can uh, let it climb uh, up into a larger structure. You can put it over an arch. I'll show that in a short video. Uh, they're different. You want to make sure you train them for the first year or two and really don't prune much on the growth, uh, unless it's uh, broken or whatever. You wanna point the tips down, very important. You can do it uh, just by cutting flush along the main canes. There's uh, two different ways, flush it's by the far the quickest, and then you'll get upward growth from that. Or you can, if you need to have it go higher, say it's part way up a fence and you want it to have some additional height, you can prune it up higher at least three to five bud eyes. For trellises or arches, you train it over the top and down. And, you, uh, and this is how you do the climbers. I'll show a short video now. Uh, this is one of my yard that I've had there probably 15 years. It's a uh, what's called a Sissinghurst arch over a uh, bench. There are two different uh, roses. This is a uh, set of two climbing roses. This ha these happen to be New Dawn. They're fairly old. They've been in these large pots in these locations for over 15 years. They go up and over uh, an arch. And the idea is from ones that are on this side, you want it to go up, over, and down. And you just prune away a lot of the material that uh, is extra, but keep them nice limber canes going up, over, and down. You want the ends to go down, and that keeps growth coming up all along, and it'll bloom all along this whole area. The other one I wanted to show you is suckers. Uh, they, they suck the life out of roses. That's why uh, the nickname suckers. They compete for the energy from the roots. They can weaken or kill the desired rose. Their growth from the rootstock, that bud union I was talking about, they're from below that bud union. That's the knob where it's budded. You want to remove them completely or they take over. And I illustrated this from a picture I took at the San Jose Rose Garden. This is not a deep pink rose. Over here, you see just a couple of blooms that are light pink. That's the desired rose. All the rest of this blooming outside the fence is uh, probably Dr. Huey, a very, very, very vigorous rose that's used for rootstock because it roots well, grows vigorously, provides a lot of energy, but it also provides suckers. Uh, these, this is a tree rose with a sucker over here and a sucker over here off the bottom. Uh, I removed those. Here's a uh, standard rose in a pot and there's a sucker over here, removed over here. You want to go down as far as you can, and if you can, break it off. Get as much of the material off as you uh, by working it back and forth. If you can't, cut it as cleanly as you can right next to the root or the root stock. Now that's the last of the videos. Uh, I want to talk about very briefly the amendments you can use. You want to uh, and the things you uh, buy plants now or late in the year is a good time to buy plants. They're available in stock uh, and they run out of some of them sometimes. Uh, you can want to buy the ones that fit the space. Put small ones in front, larger ones in back or climbers. You want to space between the plants roughly the width of a uh, mature plant. So if it says it's four feet wide at uh, maturity, you want four feet between it and the next plant. You want to test your soil conditions. 
Uh, six to seven is much better than uh, most uh, for roses, especially, but for many, many plants, uh, just very, very slightly acid. And you want to have that uh, either tested, if you uh, can afford that in a number of places in your yard, or even just simple test kits that uh, test pH help a lot because the uh, nutrients are absorbed best at that sort of pH range for roses. You want to amend the soil. If, you, if it's uh, uh, not a great soil when you're planting, maybe a third of well-rotted compost. Uh, it's especially important on manures uh, like uh, horse or uh, chicken. There's uh, some differences there I could go into. Organic fertilizers, like are shown here, these happen to be from the Lingso uh, uh, supply. And I asked if I could show these because it has a, quite a variety and they have different nutrients in them, like bone meal, very high on the middle nutrient, that's uh, phosphorus, really good for roots, and cottonseed meal, which is mixed, but has uh, it's a little acidic and it has a, uh, a predominance of nitrogen. But there's crab meal, and there's uh, blood meal, and there's bat guano. I mean, there are all sorts of organic amendments. What I use a lot is alfalfa meal, and I'll, I, uh, uh, use that because it's cheap and uh, available. Uh, actually, alfalfa pellets, you can buy them at a feed store. If you want to plant or replace, look at the plants to see which ones are poor performers. I usually give them two years. Sometimes I plant in large 15 gallon or number 15 pots that are black plastic for a couple of years and say, do I really like that plant? Do I have to get rid of another plant to plant it? Because I've got so many. If you need to do that or if something's just not doing well, there's the old shovel, shovel pruning. Uh, basically digging it out and uh, uh, definitely replacing the soil in that area uh, with uh, some good amendments and some good soil. Order bare root plants early for good selection. Own root plants, meaning they're from uh, the, the plant material that is uh, the one you want, cannot sucker. I tend to do that when I can. Most of my, all of my Sally homes are on own route. You get needed the amendments, I uh, get the needed amendments and uh, you wanna do it after testing soil pH because if it say was acid in the area, you probably don't wanna use cottonseed meal. It's a little acid. After pruning, somewhere around end of February or so, you'll see new growth. Uh, these have been bare root, you've uh, probably sprayed, they're starting to come out. Uh, you see maybe an inch of growth and you say, hey, wait a minute, that one's going into the middle. You wanna point those in to the outside. Well, you can't point the ones that are already growing, but you can take your glove, push down on them and they'll just come right off. They're very tender at that point. Uh, you do leave new growth where you want it, point it. And if there's good new growth starting from the bud union, you don't wanna break that off. You might wanna put a stake next to it to keep it from being broken off accidentally. I mentioned once bloomers, all you really do on those is shape them. There are some old uh, roses. Uh, if you've been up to Filoli when it's early in the season, you'll see a huge yellow uh, uh, Lady Banks rose. This is uh, Rosa, uh, uh, Rosa Alba uh, uh, Banksia is the name in Latin. Or there's also a, uh, uh, pardon me, the yellow is uh, Lutea. The, uh, the Blanco is the white rose version of that. They only bloom once a year. They bloom for quite a while, they bloom early, but then afterwards they're done. After where they bloom, you prune them. And you can do it with a hedge trimmer, whatever happens to be, uh, you don't have to do very, very fine pruning, but just remove the dead, damaged, or diseased growth. I mentioned fungal disease. This just shows you early in the season, you might have uh, two fungal diseases like this. The rust looks rusty. You can uh, see my finger there uh, for scale. And you can see black spot, which is uh, available more in, uh, wet weather, it uh, tends to predominate in wet weather, which we haven't had this year. And usually it goes away in the middle of summer in our climate. 
What do you do if you have that disease? Or if you don't wish to spray, uh, many people don't want to spray at all, try pruning for more air and light. Open it up in the middle. Clean up the debris. If you do spray at all, the one spray I always do, I don't do much in the year, but I do do a dormant spray, do it on my apples too, is a oil and copper. It reduces uh, disease and pests. The insects are smothered by the oils. Neem oil has some additional properties as well. Uh, black spots often worse than wet weather uh, and you wanna remove the infected leaves. If you do spray, use less toxic sprays. These are all uh, Organic Materials Research Institute certified. Anything that's that way has to be certified by USDA. Some of these same things are used on crops, on your organic crops, uh, and uh, they're less toxic. You wanna use them, uh, any of the oils or uh, any of these when bees aren't out. Well, bees aren't out when it's dormant and you have bare, uh, the, the bare canes. So dormant spraying is really important this time of year, right after you've pruned is perfect. Follow the label, always, yourself or anyone in your garden. Protect yourself, wash up afterwards. Spray early in the day. On a day that's dry, going to be dry for 24 hours. And before the bees appear, shouldn't have much of a problem in the winter. Spray oils on soaps on a day not exceeding 80 degrees to avoid spray burn. That's true in the middle of the year too. Spray the undersides of leaves as well as the tops. Wands that can be pointed up are good for that. Spray the ground around the plant lightly. And then once you get into the uh, later part of the year, March or whatever, and the rain stops, uh, set your waters to ants, uh, uh, set your timers to water deeply and infrequently. In the summer, typically five gallons per week per large plant, usually enough. A huge climber might take a little more. You wanna mulch heavily, uh, three to five inches deep is not uh, too much. It, it is quite a bit of mulch, but it's worth it. It keeps weeds down, it reduces water use, it's better for the soils, and it reduces, but you do wanna keep a, a six inch clear space right around the base uh, so that you can, uh, reduce the uh, possible fungal attack at the base of the plant. You want to use the organic fertilizers and compost under the mulch and work it into the soil at the drip line around the plant. So I'm coming to the end here. Uh, there are a couple of ways to ask questions uh, for master gardeners. We have a helpline. You can see this when we get the PDF. There's email uh, for master gardeners. Usually we would have our offices open. When we do reopen, there are three different offices, one at Elpis Ranch out in Half Moon Bay, one uh, at the, uh, on San Francisco Botanical Garden and one at Veterans Memorial Senior Center in Redwood City. Uh, and that's where I've usually given talks. I want to acknowledge Hillsborough Garden Centers for hosting There, sorry. Uh, and then most of the illustrations and photographs, all of the illustrations and photographs actually in this are by me. There is more information. Some of that's gonna be sent out, but Peninsula Row Society also has information. We meet the third Thursday right now. We're meeting on Zoom, not in July and December. During the pandemic, we also have me weekly chats at 2 p.m. on Thursdays. And you can send questions on the presentation to me at studalton at gmail.com. And you can also look at a lot of the resources under peninsularosociety.org under resources. There are references also that are online. There's some very good work that's been done by the UC Agricultural Natural Resources 
on cultural practices we control, diseases, and insects and uh, mites. There's a Rose Society, American Rose Society Consulting Rosarian Handbook that I have to uh, also go by. And it, there's also a very good uh, article on Guide to Rose Diseases and Their Management. And with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions and people can unmute. Okay. Um, I'm trying to uh, unmute everybody and I'm trying to find that. Or they can unmute themselves if it need be. I unmute it, yeah. Okay, yeah, and um, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Okay, if you haven't already, okay. I don't know how to, it says mute, unmute. Okay, you can uh, unmute I'll yourself. Unmute <laughs> <laughs> and I'd ask the uh, people on uh, PRS to wait until after the uh, other group has had a chance to ask right. questions. Right. Um, are there any questions that anybody has? I've sent a lot through chat. And if you're not a chat person, then you can uh, raise your hand. Uh, we'll go to gallery. You can raise your hand. Oh, Phoebe's husband has a <laughs> question. Uh, I'm curious about a source for buying uh, some of the sprays and uh, basic materials, soil pH measurements, where would we get a kit to do that? There are a variety of kits that uh, are available. The, the simplest ones don't test very many things. pH is one of the ones that they do test and a uh, simple little vial and uh, color uh, that is uh, indicative of the pH, sort of like, I was a chemical engineer once, so I, uh, it's sort of like a litmus test, but uh, that's probably the simplest. Many garden centers, almost all, but the good garden centers would have that. Uh, some hardware stores have that even. And you can buy them online. Uh, you can buy the little more advanced uh, kits on uh, mail order from various garden supplies. Amazon even has some. Uh, so there are various ways you can get more and more soil testing. If you want to send away for it, there are very good uh, soil testing services, but they charge for it. And they provide information on how much nutrition you can get. Uh, so that's the primary way you would get uh, soil testing. Uh, you can use these probe pH meters that have pH and moisture. You do it for potted plants to see if there's enough moisture. It says pH. They're not quite as accurate uh, as the little chemical tests. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Mary Lee, I have quite a list of the ones that came into the chat. Shall we start with those and then if people sure. want to either put more in chat or send them to you if, or then we can just have them raise hands. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stu, a couple of questions here. Um, are there roses that don't need a lot of water? And if you prune too early, what will happen to the rose shrubs? Uh, if you prune, well, I'll, I'll take the last one first. Uh, if you prune too early, like I had to do a little pruning too early to do this illustration, you might get growth early. In uh, winter areas, that might be a, more of a problem than it is here. Uh, the main problem is it's going to be pretty uh, dark and you won't get vigorous growth for quite a while. You might get a little more uh, disease because it's wet and soggy. You might get fungal disease like mildew or something. But usually the new growth is pretty strong. Uh, it's a guideline. Uh, who knows what the claim, uh, the changing climate. If you want to try and get the, uh, the, the, the when it's dark, cool, and slow growth, it's starting to get that way already. So it may not be too bad. Uh, as far as the oh no, really? Hello. No, no, I, I, I muted Christy. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, am I muted? Yes. No, you're not. Okay. Uh, the on the lower water use, there's a, a really excellent work that uh, UC Davis has been uh, doing to try and find out what they can do to identify the best roses for low water use. You can actually go UC Davis. Uh, I, I forget if it's sustainability, but it's water use roses. You'll find it, I'm sure some of the information, 
And what they did was they uh, only, they mulched heavily, they put these things out in a field in Davis, which is a lot warmer and hotter, mm -hmm. and uh, they watered them very infrequently, a couple of times the whole summer. And uh, what happens is they go a little do bit dormant in the summer. They, they slow down their blooming, but they still survive. So it depends on uh, you know, which ones are best. Some of the very old roses with very deep roots can survive for quite a while without watering. What you wanna do is train the roses to that by watering infrequently and deeply. You want the roots to go way, way down and then the water, like say from a dripper or a bubbler to go right in the root zone and not water the rest of the yard necessarily if it's all mulched anyway. It, uh, uh, but if you have plants all over, try and uh, not overwater, but do it infrequently and get the roots to go down. Great, thank you very much. I have a number of questions here about the pruning of roses. Which roses do you cut one third and which ones do you leave alone? And can you talk about cutting at an angle versus cutting straight across? Yeah. Um, how does that, can, um, what you want to separate them? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the uh, angle versus straight across, frankly, they did a test over at, I believe it was St. Albans in uh, England, mm -hmm. where the three identical beds did the same roses, identically uh, grown, fertilized, and they cut three ways. One, the way I just taught, at an angle uh, with a sharp shears. Second, straight across, sharp shears. Third one, hedge trimmers, whoosh, right across. Uh, <laughs> they all worked. Uh, so it's not going to kill the rose. You might have a little more dieback, a, a little more uh, frayed ends and et cetera with the hedge trimmers. Uh, the natural healing angle is a little bit of an angle but you know, 45 degrees is not critical. Uh, there's a debate about whether it's absolutely necessary or not. So, but that uh, was above the above, um, the above the bud. If you like cut below inch. the bud, I mean, if you go on an angle on the bud, it will die back. Because if you think about it, the bud's over here trying to uh, draw moisture, and the okay. cut is the re releasing moisture, and it dries up. Uh, I think that was the question. Is there another? Can I miss one? And then, um, I lost you. My internet no, just they, they, stopped they, for a the, minute. The question. Uh, what about, sorry, it was the cutting uh, of a third versus two thirds. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So the first part of the question was just cutting yeah. out. Which roses do you do one third and which ones do you leave alone? Uh, yeah, the uh, one third, uh, a good example is the climber. Uh, you're not cutting even a third of that out. You're cutting out some of the uh, material along the top that's just hanging out there. Uh, you're cutting back uh, to nice strong growth. You're getting rid of dead and diseased. And frankly, you may not be able to reach some of the uh, foliage on the top. You do the best you can. You can use a hedge trimmer if you need to. Uh, and that you might cut back even less than a third. And especially when the climber is getting going, you don't want to cut that back hardly at all. Uh, you want to prune it so that uh, it, it can reach its final shape. The uh, floribundas are typically smaller roses that have a lot of flowers. You don't need to cut those back as much either. In fact, you need to leave a little more branching structure. I didn't illustrate that in the video, but uh, uh, again, you can shear it off a little bit, maybe a third, take the height down. But say it grew a lot during the year, you fed it a lot, it, uh, you've got a three foot high rose that grew an extra three feet. Uh, yeah, you might take that one down a little more than a third, uh, even on a floribunda, and, but leave more branching structure. Uh, if you like long stems, say for flower arrangements, uh, cutting it back further and leaving less material it still has the same root strength. So you'll get longer blooms and uh, more single stems for arrangements. If you want more flowers in the garden, you want a lot of floral display, uh, cut a little less. Thank you. Uh, what about tree roses? What, is there a standard 
number of canes you should keep, usually three or four, or what's best? Uh, I use my hands again. Okay. Uh, you think of the three to five on each side, and you remember that illustration. Uh, that's good. You can, you can cut out old ones that are weak or uh, very spindly uh, canes that come from the bud unions. There are two of them there. So you might have up to maybe 10, but you can do with uh, less on a three rows or a standard. Here's a good question about what can you do with the suckers once you cut them out? Can you try to uh, replant, or can you try to grow those? Uh, the, the thing about suckers is yes, you can. However, you may not want to, uh, <laughs> unless you want something that blooms once, because many of them are red. They're on what's called Dr. Huey rootstock, very often used in California and Texas to grow roses. Very, very vigorous. So that's why it takes over. Uh, if you want a red climber that blooms once, uh, Dr. Huey's not a bad rose. It's not as highly rated because not many people want it. Uh, but there's a rating system in the American Rose Society. Here's a good question about when you're planting a bare root rose, what should you feed it to give it a jump start? And can you also talk about your use of alfalfa pellets? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I actually have a repotting rose video that's separate from this. And it's actually a fairly long video because I take a big uh, container and that same rose that we, uh, I, you saw me prune for a shrub, I repot it. And uh, that shows basically getting rid of the potting soil that's in there uh, uh, by, but keeping the root bulb, knock the whole thing out, root prune it and repot it. But if you're doing it bare root, what you do is you make a mound on the bottom of the hole or the pot and way at the bottom, you put any fertilizers. I tend to put only organics that break down slowly with time and temperature and water. Uh, the bacteria actually breaks it down to make usable nutrients out of that. And I tend to use alfalfa pellets in that area. Any well composted rotted manures and uh, things like uh, phosphate rock, uh, which provides phosphorus. Phosphorus doesn't move through the soil well, so I put it way down low. Put a little layer of uh, soil over the top, maybe a few uh, starter uh, organic materials in that dusting area. Sometimes uh, even, uh, I talk in that video about mycorrhizal inoculants that make it so that you can uh, have better root growth. And then uh, fill in with dirt around it. Water well, and that's how you re you plant a bare root rose. Uh, I, it's uh, complicated to go into in too much detail, but there's that's the basics. Right. Thank um, you. Another question about the the one you've taken out of it's you've had it in that pot for years. You're going to take it out now. Uh, I've done that many times. You take it out. You cut the roots. How much of the roots should you take off, or you the, the you know all the roots? You might want to look at the repotting video. Uh, the okay. repotting video uh, shows how I did it. I actually have a big old stainless steel bread knife and I cut out about a third, maybe a half of the root ball. Uh, and I left the rest of the root ball. In the process, I decapped his worms. I had some very nice uh, <laughs> worm, worms in the, uh, the process and it's a funny part of the video, but uh, it, it showed that it was nice, healthy soil. And yeah. uh, so I actually use that soil elsewhere in the garden, but I replenish the soil with new soil, knocked out about a, a, a third to a half of that root ball. Okay, so you just said soil. So is there any specific soil? I go to Linzo, I just uh, get... Well, I, I buy soil by the cubic yard and put it in a trailer. And uh, I like a uh, nice sandy, uh, but loamy mix uh, and, and uh, they have nice bark, sand, and, and uh, compost, uh, turkey compost that I like. It's called veggie mix. I use it on my tomatoes, they love it. I use it on uh, my roses, they love it. Uh, they don't have it all year because wet weather and turkey manure don't go together very well in the uh, yard. Uh, but that's what I tend to use. But any good 
uh, soil, garden soil with compost. You want to tend to use lighter ones in pots. If you use ones with a lot of gravel or heavier soils, it makes the pot really heavy, hard to move. Right, because they have a they have a potting soil. Yes, and that works too. I've used that. It has more aeration in it, uh, and there are different things you can use for aeration. And you know they have a diesel now. Yeah, the, the diesel compost I use as compost. The, uh, the diesel is in the uh, veggie mix. Okay, so veggie. So you just mix kind of the veggie mix with the um, with the potting soil. Actually, I use pure veggie mix. Pure, pure veggie mix. Soil. Okay. It's a little sandier, a little heavier, but uh, it's it's very well drained. Just with your roses. No, I use it on almost everything. I use it on potty, potting many things, and I get, tomatoes love it with a new like veggie. Okay, all right. I'm, I I'm, have a couple of questions about um, treating things like powdery mildew, and what do you do about aphids? Uh, you there's take soap water spray on aphids. Uh, yeah, uh, aphids in the early part of the year, water spray. There are some tips like uh, get one of the angled sprayers that you can point upward and stand away from it, like there's a three foot one. And I replace the head with something like a fogit nozzle, F-O-G-G-I-T, fogit nozzle uh, at two gallons a minute. Uh, that gives a very nice uh, spray that doesn't decimate the plant, but does a great job of knocking off the aphids. You can also use it for mites and uh, actually, uh, that that's helpful for uh, aphids early in the year. Aphids are dumb; they don't come back. You get about ninety percent each time, so you do it a couple times. You've gotten rid of the aphids, and the ladybugs can take care of the rest. The uh, uh, the other part of the question: Powder, powdery mildew. Yeah, there's a, a recent uh, research done. Uh, the old, uh, I think it was University of uh, North Carolina idea was dish detergent and baking soda. That is uh, not as effective as a relative of that, which is uh, potassium bicarbonate rather than sodium bicarbonate. And the brand name is uh, bicarb old fashioned fungicide. Uh, bicarb old fashioned fungicide. And the research has shown that uh, at UC- well, I guess any phone will work. Uh, somebody's not on mute. Uh, yeah. Well, um, we unmuted people. It's um, that is. It, it, anyway, uh, the bicarb old-fashioned fungicide is available in most garden centers, and it's uh, certified as non-toxic. Uh, you probably don't need that much potassium. The plants actually like potassium more than sodium, so uh, it's uh, a, a useful in, a nutrient as well. And that actually can be used as an eradicant on roses. It talks about that in one of the uh, references. And I, I'll put that in the newsletter. Also, you just talked about ladybugs. Yeah. And uh, they need to be set at a, they need to have food. That would be an aphid. Right. That would be in the morning or the late evening. Well, uh, ladybugs uh, and other beneficial insects uh, like aphids, and so, uh, but it, when they get when you get rid of the aphids, they go on to the next yard. Uh, so, uh, it, releasium works, but it may not work for very long. Uh, aphids uh, are, as I say, they're they're only one of the possible pests, and many. What you want to do is something called integrated pest management. Get the bug, good bugs to eat the bad bugs, and that's and you want things like companion planting and and a variety of plants to attract the good uh, insects to the garden and to keep the uh, plants in balance. That way you have to use very little uh, in the way of pesticides. I've gotten to almost no spray, except for usually the one and a very, very minimal amount of spot sprays of only organics. I have almost no pests. I have almost no diseases in these 250 roses in Menlo Park. now. Probably this year I'll have some just because I said that, but mm -hmm. you, know, it's, uh, you only only spray what you have to, only spray uh, when you're working on specific things. And there are lots of non-toxic treatments for many, many things. There are things like the, uh, the uh, 
Curlico weevil. It's a rose weevil and it comes back every year. And if you treat that properly, it won't come back. And if you don't, it'll come back every year. Uh, it, it makes a sucking uh, probe uh, by, with its weevil nose into the rose and you see these buds that have holes in them. And then they mm -hmm. die, they fall on the ground. And then next year you'll get them again because they overwinter in the ground. So what do you do for those? Uh, you, you get a bucket of soapy water, you come up on them and they jump off and they jump in the soapy water and drown. What? Or hand pick them. Well, wait a minute, you, you do that on the rose, the bud. You put the bucket, bucket under the rose and you either hand pick them or let them fall into that. Uh, there is a uh, soil derived bacteria uh, material called spinosat, which uh, has a terrible name, that Dr. Jack's dead bug spray. Uh, and it has this soil borne bacteria that's organic, but it, uh, it does work on cutworms, on those sorts of things in, in the garden. Okay, Dr. Jack, what bug? Dead bug. Dead bug. And I think <laughs> one of the uh, rose people just came on uh, I think she must have thought it was at 11. <laughs> oh, well. Um, okay, well, that's that's great. Dr. Jack Deadbug for yeah, uh, Weevil. Look it up online uh, to get the exact name. I think that's close. Dr. Jack's, I think, Deadbug. Uh-huh. Okay. Anybody else have a question? I have one or two left here from the chat. Uh, um, Catherine asks, who decides the name for the new roses? <laughs> It's a great story. Uh, Peace came out as an example uh, with uh, the same day as Peace broke out. Uh, and that's why it got named that. Uh, the, it, it was named that later. Uh, there's things like uh, uh, Julia Childs. If it's a living person, they have to agree to have you use their name. If it's not, they can be named after various historical figures. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are named after Shakespearean in the David Austin's. Uh, my favorite is Julia Childs, though, because uh, what color would you guess David, uh, the Julia Child rose is? It, I know it's yellow, and I happen to be down in Montecito mm -hmm. at this particular nursery, and they're the ones that came up with it because she visited them, and it was, uh, what does it go? Egg butter milk? Yeah, uh, well, uh, egg butter milk or butter yellow. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. yellow, and that was one of the things she always used was it. So, right. uh, and and uh, then the my, the funniest one is uh, just Joey. Apparently, the hybridizer was showing around uh, the person looking at it, and uh, he was going to name it, and he said, and they asked, "What's the name?" He said, "Joey." So the person said, "Just Joey." And he liked yeah. it. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. It's true, but it's a great story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything well, else? That's all of the questions from the chat box, and I see that it's already after 11. So um, I don't know if you want to open it up and to yes. any more questions. Yeah, and you can just unmute yourself.